Well, thank you, and thank you for being here. When I was first asked as a president of APS who I'd want to interview, the person that jumped to mind was Claude Steele. Claude is one of the rare psychological scientists who has, in my opinion, changed the world. His groundbreaking discoveries of how our own identity and sense of self interacts with our social environments to affect our behavior provided a novel lens under which to think about the influence of social factors in psychology. He showed how a disadvantageous pairing between our social identity and a social situation can have a seemingly subtle impact on behavior with potentially profound consequences. So prior to this interview, I was talking um, to my friend and collaborator, Mazar Banaji, who worked with you as a postdoc, um, about, about Claude. And uh, I was trying to put my finger on what it is about Claude's work that I find so compelling. And she summed it up for me perfectly. She called Claude the Albert Einstein of social psychology. So no pressure, Claude. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I mean, what, what, what she meant by this was like, much like Einstein is said to have had these, this gift of instinct to see the world in a unique way that changed physics. Claude's gift is that sort of natural instinct to see the world, uh, the social world, and the person in it in a, in a unique way that perfectly captures that interaction. Um, so before I begin talking to Claude about his research and his life, I want to give you a little of Claude's background. Um, so I'm just going to go through his academic history. He was an undergraduate at Hiram College in Ohio and went to Ohio State University where, where he received his PhD. His first faculty position was at the University of Utah uh, which he left after a few years to take a position at the University of Washington, Seattle. He then served on the, fa uh, the faculty at University of Michigan for several years, and um, from there went on to Stanford University for 18 years. While at Stanford, he eventually served in a number of administrative positions, including the director of the Center of Comparative Studies in Race and Ethnicity, the director of the Center for Advanced Study in Behavioral Sciences, and the dean of the Stanford Graduate School for Education. He left Stan Stanford to become provost of Columbia University in New York City, and has recently started a new position as the provost of the University of California at Berkeley. So needless to say, Claude has countless academic publications and received numerous awards and honors, including being elected a fellow of the National Academy of Sciences. So I could go on and on about Claude, as you can imagine, um, and talk about his publications, but I don't really, I don't think anyone here is, is here really to listen to me talk about Claude. Um, I think they're here to hear Claude talk about Claude, so we'll just uh, get to it. Um, so I just want to thank you to start for agreeing to sit down with me today. It's just an, such an honor for me. It's great. Oh, it's, a big, it's a big honor for me. Okay. And to get to talk about yourself, I mean, <laughs> who can turn that down? <laughs> well, every good psychologist knows you should let somebody else talk about themselves, yeah. right? Um, so I want to start at the very beginning, if you don't mind. I just want to ask you, you know, a little bit, if you could just sort of fill us in on your background and your family, where you grew up. <coughs> and really how you got inspired to end up at Hiram College and studying psychology. Hmm. Uh, I, I'm not sure that that really called on a lot of inspiration. Uh, I, I uh, went there, my mother had gone to that college. Oh. And uh, when I got out of high school, uh, or I was graduating from high school, uh, I applied there in the University of Illinois. I grew up in Chicago, and so those seemed to be in those days, the, the two options, and, and uh, I was a swimmer, uh, and, and Hiram College gave me a swimming scholarship, wow. so I, it was easy. I went there. <laughs> <laughs> did, you know, did you know when you went there that you wanted to study psychology? No, no, I didn't. I, I, if I had to answer that question, I, I would have said I wanted to be a dentist because <laughs> uh, the guy who, uh, my, the, guy, the, the dentist in my neighborhood was named Claude. <laughs> and, and he had a very attractive wife, and I thought, how, <laughs> how bad could it be <laughs> to be a dentist? <laughs> so you know how kids at that age. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I went pretty, pretty much unknowing about psychology, as I'm afraid too many uh, college kids come in without much exposure to, to, uh, to psychology as a field. Um, but when I took the first psychology course, and it, it was... Uh, you know, it was nothing to brag about. These were, this was the day, this was the height of behaviorism and uh, the reduction of all psychology to behavior. I remember the first lecture was, uh, that the, the first thing that the lecturer said was, you don't think that psychology is about the mind, it's about behavior. That was the mm -hmm. ethos of the day. Uh, and I still liked it. <laughs> 
Uh, Did you disagree when you were in that class? Uh, I, I thought it was interesting what he said, and, and I wanted to know what he meant. And I, f I found behaviorism fascinating, and still do, maybe as many yeah. psychologists of my age uh, do. Um, you know, it was turned over within a short number of years as the major paradigm in psychology, uh, and uh, kind of lost as the driving framework for the field. But, uh, but there were many exciting, interesting things about it, yeah. uh, about the regulation, that you could regulate yourself through regulating behavior, and, and B.F. Skinner was the most radical version of that, and he had all these interesting self-modification programs and self-improvement programs, and, and uh, so th that was kind of the tenor of the times. There was excitement around that, uh, that idea. Was there, were there any early mentors or role models that uh, inspired you along this path? Um, there was. Uh, uh, Ralph Sabula and George Morgan were the psychology professors mm -hmm. at, uh, and Ray Knight were the psychology professors at Hiram when I went there. And uh, for some reason, uh, they thought maybe they were rec recruiting kids to be psychology majors. I, I don't know. But they seemed interested in me. And so I took psychology courses, and, and you know how things just came together. I, I, I loved it. I, felt, I didn't know that I was going to feel that way about it, but once I was in there, I felt very comfortable in psychology, and, gave, and I liked all parts of it. You gave up the idea of being a dentist named Claude. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Soon it seemed kind of ridiculous. Yeah. But, uh, but the I prefrontal cortex been. wasn't wholly there yet, so it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, so, so then you went to the Ohio State University. Uh, for, which has a history of excellent training in social psychology. Mm -hmm. So what was the topic of your graduate research and what did you take from it? Uh, super erogatory indirect attitude change was the title. That was of my the title? <laughs> the title of my <laughs> dissertation. You want to uh, unpack that for us? Yeah. <laughs> uh, boy, I freaking remember that. Um, I but I, I'll say this about Ohio State. At the t I had the good fortune to go there when uh, uh, Tim Brock and Tony Greenwald and um, Bib Latney uh, and Tom Ostrom, my advisor, were all going to make that a strong social psychology program. And without any, it's one of those real fortuitous turns of life mm -hmm. that you go to a place when, when the place all of a sudden starts to form and take shape. And, and uh, that was a very fortunate turn of events uh, for me. I, d I did work on uh, um, the idea that a persuasive message directed at one argument could have an effect on some other related arguments, uh -huh. un, uh, and sometimes even unrelated arguments. And the dissertation was trying to figure out how on earth could that happen. And, and the way I'd characterize the general problem is it was sort of early social cognition. That's kind of what Tom Ostrom eventually moved into was, was a, a clear focus on social cognition as an approach to social psychology. So if you were to go back and read your dissertation today, how do you think you'd uh, evaluate it? Wow. Um, <laughs> first, I'd hope it was written well, and I don't know. I feel a little <laughs> trepidation about that. Do you have a copy that. anywhere? I, I, I bet I have a copy yeah. somewhere. I bet I have a copy. I've moved a lot. They as have you, one as in you Ohio noted, State, probably. And you yeah. lose things when you move, yeah. so I can't guarantee that, but uh, I may have a copy. Uh -huh. Maybe I'll go back and look at yeah, it. Yeah, it'd be interesting. Um, so, uh, so your first research lab was at the University of Utah. Um, but, you know, so what was the first study you did when you actually had your own lab? Uh, we called innocent women in Salt Lake City on the telephone. And, uh, you knew they and, were innocent? And they were yeah. randomly <laughs> picked. Maybe I didn't know that, yeah. but I presumed you, that. Yeah, okay. uh, and we <laughs> insulted them. <laughs> and then we called them back two days later and asked them to cooperate with uh, the, a food co-op by listing everything in their kitchens. Uh, this was the day, these were the days when uh, compliance, what made people comply, was mm -hmm. a big question. And uh, I had the idea that uh, people might comply in order to just feel better about themselves. So if you did something relatively minor that made them feel not so good about themselves, like we would say on the phone, uh, I'm not proud of this, I, I have to stress. Yeah, it's a little odd to call innocent women yeah, and you, insult them. Yes, was, yeah. this was... <laughs> This was social psychology before IRBs. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we said, well, it's pretty much common, in the way of setting up the call, it's pretty much common knowledge that women in your community are not very cooperative with, with uh, aren't very good drivers. 
uh, or they aren't uh, very cooperative with community projects. We would say something like that. And then they'd get a call two days later asking them to do this long and involved thing. And lo and behold, if, if they'd gotten a prior call that was negative, they were more compliant. They helped a lot more than they did if you said nothing. Or So um, uh, there, we had a finding, and uh, we published it. And uh, so, I, I so would say... I, I, interestingly, it, it did provide a foundation for uh, what later became research on self-affirmation processes. It, it, it did have a life later, uh, but it took a long time for that to happen. The most interesting part of the finding was that people were, were called the name about one thing, but they were willing to do something completely unrelated that would make themselves feel better, as a, more willing to do, do that, even though it couldn't redress the the, the name they were called at all. Yeah. So why would that be? Why would, how could unrelated things work like that? And, and the, that finding undergirded self-affirmation Your, your first major, major theoretical contribution. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so you, you only stayed at uh, University of Utah a few years, mm -hmm. uh, and then you went to University of Washington. How come you moved so quickly? <laughs> Uh, African Americans in Salt Lake City in 1971. It was, uh, it was not pretty. It wasn't. Uh, it wasn't a comfortable situation. Right. <laughs> uh, and um, we'd never been west of Dorothy, my wife, and I. We'd never been west of the Mississippi, and so I just didn't know what it would be like. And this was this was in the days when the Mormon Church was very different than it is now, <laughs> and uh, uh, it had explicit strictures against uh, blacks and. Uh, we were in housing discrimination suits right away. Oh my goodness! It was uh, so. So we looked quickly to get out. <laughs> yeah. And got out to Seattle, and it was that was wonderful. So, so were there any other primary challenges you'd say, aside from that, like early in your career that you had to face? Well, uh, yeah. I you know I say this. I have a great deal of empathy for young people in the field. Um, uh, I, finding a problem to to work on and. Yeah. And getting a, a program of research that, that can be productive was um, uh, an effort, and it took me a while to do it. Yeah. Well, you started right away, it sounded like. I mean, uh, granted, I it, was a, it was an odd, uh, an odd avenue to take to call women and insult them on the phone, but, yeah. <laughs> um, but nevertheless. You had to be a, there. You had a, to be there. <laughs> it was, it was the sure. times. Yes, okay. Um, <laughs> But, you know, it sounds like you jumped into something. I mean, maybe your whole theory didn't evolve there, but, you know, at least you kind of fairly quickly got into sort of a topic that really intrigued you enough. So, mm -hmm. so, so let's move to that. So you then, you know, you spent close to 20 years at University of Washington, and that was really the place where I think you developed self-affirmation theory um, sort of more fully, and really it became well-known and popular. Um, so can you just kind of tell us about your intellectual path uh, you know, that led you to develop that idea? and and what is your view of the significance of this work in the field of psychology? Mm -hmm. um, I'd always, you, you learn a lot from teaching, and, and certainly I think I learned the most about social psychology from teaching it. And in the process, you have ideas. And I'd always wondered about cognitive dissonance theory, which was mm -hmm. certainly the dominant framework of the day. And the idea was a profound idea that mental life was driven forward by a need for cognitive consistency, consistency among important ideas, I, I always thought cognitive dissonance explained graduate school. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, you don't get paid any money, you work really hard. That's right. You, you don't get a lot of reward, and yet you love it. And that you say, right. <laughs> you say you love it. And, yeah. <laughs> uh, and then you have a consistent set of cognition. Exactly. That's a perfect example. feel very comfortable with that, yeah. Um, but I, I always wondered, well, is it really consistency that people are after in these experiments, these dissonance experiments? Because I could just see from real life that we could tolerate, people every day tolerated inconsistencies pretty easily. Yeah. So uh, the alternative idea was that, no, people aren't concerned about uh, consistency. They're concerned about maintaining an ongoing image of the self as good and competent and adaptively adequate, morally competent and adequate, uh, and that what a inconsistency of the sort used in dissonance experiments, what that does is to sort of puncture that self-image, and then we sort of, we sort of scramble around to, to repair it, and that, that's what is dissonance reduction, that's that rationalization that tries to eliminate the inconsistency. 
and that uh, if what I was arguing was true, you could do something that would just repair this global image of self-competence. If you could repair that image it, and leave the inconsistency intact, people would tolerate the inconsistency because they didn't care about it. What they cared about was this larger image of, of a coherent, competent sense of self. So that's what we embarked on in, in, in the research, was trying to make that. And you can see that came out of that name-calling research that people would do after they'd been made to feel not so good. They would do things even unrelated to the charge, to the name, uh, in order to feel better. It was about, the argument was, it was about maintaining this sense of self and that that's what drives mental life and psychological life forward is this ongoing uh, uh, motor, this engine, which, which we all have all the time uh, that, that tries to maintain an image of ourselves as morally and adaptively adequate. And it takes a lot of work and that we're always doing it. We're, re, we're knitting together a perception of the self that way. And that if I could just affirm that, people would tolerate all kinds of inconsistencies. And that's basically what our experiments were about. And, and that led to the manipulation of self-affirmation. And the, exper the, the theory sort of lived on in time because of the manipulation. It turned out that if you affirm people, if you allow them to, to uh, affirm something that's very important and central to them, uh, we can take negative information better, we can admit to health problems better, we can, uh, we're, we can do all kinds of things because we have this, this global sense of, of self-restored and then we're better able to uh, deal with, to, to tolerate inconsistencies and threats of lesser mm -hmm. Sorts. So if you had to sort of give advice, practical, you know, advice based on self-affirmation theory, what would it be? Uh, I, would, I would say, I think, and I, and I think we do, we know this at some intuitive level, uh, that before you make judgments about th things, get a little distance, a little mm -hmm. perspective, because that allows you to, for, for this larger sense of who you are to come into play, come into view, and contextualize the particular. Mm -hmm. uh, which, which otherwise will run away with you and capture you. Uh, and f you, know, you get sort of tunneled into dealing with that particular thing. But you know, if a couple days go by, you've had a good conversation with a friend, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> you, see, you saw a good movie, I don't know, whatever your, uh -huh. your remedies are, e even have a good drink, because that's also one of the things <laughs> that we looked at. Uh, <laughs> that particular thing is, is no longer that that capturing right. of, of you. So speaking of drinking, um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, when you're at University of Washington, you started to get involved in research on alcohol addiction, which is a little odd for a social psychologist. So how'd that happen? I can remember that thinking, boy, I've, not only is my career off to a slow start, but, but, but here, here I am studying this problem that nobody in my field cares about. <laughs> what, what kind of judgment is this <laughs> that, I, that I lack? Um, it just came about because it was, it was the, uh, one of the flagship pr ship problems in the psych department at the University of Washington at the time. Mm -hmm. and Alan Marlott, a great alcohol, addictive behaviors researcher, uh, was a good friend. We played poker together. And uh, he would tell me about these things. And I went away on a vacation, and I just had an idea. And I thought, that, I bet that's true. And then I came back and did a very primitive meta-analysis of the literature. On and it supported addiction? that. On it, the, the, the idea was that, that the main thing alcohol does to you is, is fuzzy up your thinking. You can't, you can't see the consequences of your action. You can't see norms of conduct that you'd normally bring to bear. Mm -hmm. All that's blind. You're in, you're in a myopia. All you see is what's in front of you. And so if, if what's in front of you is, is, the, is an impulse to do something that if you were sober, you'd normally just hold it in. But if, you're, if, if, if alcohol has robbed you of this capacity, your behavior is going to be more excessive and more extreme. And um, a lot had been looked at in the literature with regard to aggression and things of that mm -hmm. sort. But to make this point, we, showed, we tried to show that you'd even be more helpful if, if you were intoxicated and somebody asked you to do something that was helpful but that was really onerous and you did not want to do 
and that when you were sober and in possession of your resources, your faculties, you would not do it. That was the control group. Uh -huh. if, you got, <laughs> if, you got to, if you got a little drunk, you would do it. And so that's what the, that research focused on. So you brought people into the laboratory and you gave them beers? What'd you do? How did yeah, this work? We, we, we gave them vodka and, uh, <laughs> and tonics. Uh, you, uh -huh. can, you can, it's all oh, this literature. This was fun doing this research, <laughs> I have to say. Uh, but we used to get people's blood alcohol level to 0.08, and uh, that's sort of the, in the literature the, 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 where you're, you're good and intoxicated at uh -huh. that point. It takes about 45 minutes about uh, depending on your body weight, you know, three drinks, uh, and uh, you're kind of flying. And when you're flying and the, and the experimenter comes in and says, look, would you help me do more, um, and you, this horrible, boring decoding task where you had to cross the A's and E's out of a paragraph of legal jargon for, an, <laughs> and, and you've, you've already done it and you're tired of it, and you, when you're sober you say, no thanks, I, I gotta go. But when you're drunk like that, you're flying, you say, yeah, sure, I'll help you. <laughs> <laughs> so that was fun. Yeah. <laughs> so, so that was sort of the theory of alcohol myopia, correct? Yeah, it, al it also had, yeah. had a, a, a part of it that why does alcohol make you uh, reduce anxiety and depression and right. so on? And the idea was the same thing. It fuzzies up your thinking. Um, and so you can only think about what's myopically in front of you. Yeah. Uh, and if you put something like a party or a baseball game or something you like in that little aperture of a remaining capacity, if you stick that in there, uh, you're going you're gonna to have a good time. Mm -hmm. And alcohol creates a euphoria because it blocks out all those disturbing worries and things and focuses you on this little thing. So, so this concept of this myopia, uh, is it a component of other addictive behaviors like the, you know, us constantly checking our iPhones or something like that? I think it is. I yeah. think, yeah, I've thought, I've thought about that. Yeah? Yeah. So when, um, you, when you're in meetings with undergraduates and they're sort of checking yeah. their iPhone when they're in a conversation with the provost, you, <laughs> you think about that? I wish I was in conversations with more undergraduates. Yeah, I'm usually in conversations that. with lawyers at this point. <laughs> Are they checking their iPhones all and the time? And they're checking their iPhones. Yeah. That's annoying. Yeah. <laughs> um, so what did you love about University of Washington? You were there for an awfully long well, time. Well, yeah, I, we loved the city. We loved the, the, uh, uh, our life there. You know, our kids were, were, of, were born and raised there. And, and uh, Seattle is a really smart, cool town. Mm -hmm. And I, we felt fortunate to uh, have, have wound up there. Uh, uh, so it, it had jazz, it had environmental beauty, all, all kinds of things that make you happy. Yeah. So, so, but you know, you said earlier that you felt like you had a slow career to your, a slow start to your career, and then you moved into alcohol. Why do you feel that was slow? Because you got sort of two major theories going early on. Well, I, I didn't tell you about those years there. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> between the name calling experiment and the uh, the emergence of those two lines of research, uh -huh. and there there was a good six or seven years in there that were pretty anxiety arousing, I yeah. have to say. Was that around the tenure time and yeah. all of that? Yeah, during the tenure time. And I, I could do, uh, I've described this before, I could do scattered experiments and, and get them published and I got tenure. Mm -hmm. But they were unrelated and I couldn't, I didn't really know how to get a program of research going. And I always admired Stanley Schachter's work and I reread all of it one summer and I thought, that's how you do it. You, you, you get a problem and you get some data uh, and you figure out the best interpretation you can for what that data is and then you test that in the most creative way you can and then you kind of track down uh, a, a problem that way, experiment after experiment, a, a narrative start, starts to unfold and, and once, once I kind of understood that, I understood how to get these, it, it, it the product of that understanding was the getting of these two lines of research going. Did you ever meet Stanley Schachter? Uh, and I had, I've never met him. Yeah, you just, you just, his work sort of taught you how to be a... Yeah, he was a great writer. Artist. Yeah. He was a great writer and that made the work and the narrative very accessible. So you're a pretty good writer too. Do you want to uh, tell us about your writing process? Sort of what's mm -hmm. difficult for you, what's easy for you? Well, um, 
Yeah, uh, I do take writing very seriously. I've always liked it. I've liked it all my life. I, prob I, I think uh, I might have been a writer if I hadn't been a, a, a mm -hmm. social psychologist, if I hadn't found that field. Uh, I'm, I'm not, I don't like being alone enough maybe to be a real <laughs> <laughs> novelist, but, and I, I like social psychology because it's so interactive and, and the, all of the ideas you have are a product of all the relationships you have. That's, I, wrote, I wrote this book about stereotype threat in a way to convey how social, the birthing of ideas and experiments and questions, how, how that's what I, I loved about that. But, but the writing part, I, I, I just like being clear and fun to read. I, I want to get that in the, in the Which work. Which is, I think, an underappreciated thing in psychology. Yes. Or science in general, just, just excellent writing that people can, yeah. can read and follow and see the story. And so I really appreciate that about your work. Yeah. Um, so your book that you just mentioned, mm -hmm. which is about stereotype threats. So I want to ask you about that in a second. But uh, your book's called Whistling Vivaldi and other clues to how stereotypes affect us. Mm -hmm. So Whistling Vivaldi, where did that come from? That was a story from um, Brent Staples, who's an editorialist for the New York Times, African American, and he wrote a book, a biography, and he described the story in it was him walking down the streets of Chicago, Hyde Park, as a graduate student, He's a pretty big guy, and um, finding that he was making, his mere presence was making whites feel uncomfortable. And he realized that he was being seen through the lens of a stereotype. He's a graduate student, but he's being seen as a potentially menacing black guy. So uh, he feels trapped by this, by this perception and doesn't know what to do and incidentally is trying to become a whistler. And so he practices. That was just a side habit? It says he was doing this. Yeah. You have to know Brent to okay. make sense <laughs> of this. <laughs> and so he starts whistling Beatles tunes and Vivaldi, which I've only met one person in real life who could whistle Vivaldi, but uh, it can be done. Uh, and so he's going down the street doing this, and people hear him, and they, ah, they see him differently. So it was, a, it was just a, a story that captured the phenomenon, the experience of sensing that you can be seen in terms of a stereotype about your group and, and not in terms of who you are and that people are reacting to you uh, in terms of that, guided by that stereotype. And did you experience that growing up? Oh, sure. Yeah. 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 I, you know, we all experience stereotype threat, I think, yeah. maybe daily. But you weren't, daily. Think, you weren't thinking about it like that at the time? No, no. Yeah. I had no, um, no idea of it. Although. In retrospect, I can, as I try to do in the book, go back to periods of, of my life where I think it was particularly intense. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I, I, maybe self-servingly, who knows, as a theorist, but uh, I interpret those experiences in terms of stereotype threat. Graduate school. Graduate school in particular. Yeah. I mean, that's what I talk about in the book, is that experience of it. There are, of course, others. but. Uh, at the time, you, you, it's, just, it's just a deduction from the world you're in. That, that's one of the, the insights about it that surprised me the most. It's, it's not so much who you really are, because I had one personality in my world uh, that was pretty outgoing. Mm -hmm. uh, and, but in graduate school, uh, there you are, the only African-American student in the whole graduate program at the time. And there was another guy a year ahead of me. Um, your group, you just can't quite be confident that you're not being seen in a certain way or being, if you make a mistake, you're being judged in a certain way in terms of that stereotype. And, and this is a high stakes situation. You want to succeed and mm -hmm. you've put your, you've put, you've bet on it. You put yourself behind it. So it's a highly pressured situation. And, and, and it's all about the thing that your group is negatively stereotyped about. Uh, so, uh, you know, who, who's, who's smart? Who's really smart? You know, who's good? Who's good? Who's really good? And, and uh, uh, there's nobody in the field in, in, uh, uh, from your group who was really good. So anyway, it's, so, it's those deductions from uh -huh. the cues, from the elements of the situation that just, like it or not, give you this, this problem to deal with. So, so, you're, so your two early major contributions, self-affirmation theory, alcohol myopia, um, they were pretty much <coughs> University of Washington, and then you really didn't start to 
investigate stereotype threats so much until you got to the University of Michigan. Is that correct? So, so what? You didn't start to think about that problem until I got. So to you, uh, so you, uh, why did you move there? And what can you just take us on sort of the path of, of you know, the intellectual path of how you develop that idea and that theory and the things that inspired you? Uh, Michigan had offered me a job that was half-time psychology and half-time directing a minority support program at mm -hmm. Michigan. And, Did you uh, get a lot of those offers for the minority and yeah, academia? Oh yeah. yeah, oh yeah. So it, it wasn't too surprising, although Michigan is a great social yeah. psychology program. Was so. it a burden or was it something you looked forward to doing? Um, I, I was really, I was pretty good in my uh, career uh, avoiding administrative work for a long time. Now that <laughs> Until now, sounds right. ironic uh, in, in against recent yeah. uh, choices <laughs> I've made. Uh, but uh, at the time, I really wanted to do that, yeah. to go to Michigan to be in the social psych program because it was so exciting, such an atmosphere. But uh, I didn't want to do that program, so we said no. Mm -hmm. Then the next year, they came back with a full job in psychology, and I said yes. And I went there, and I, I felt uh, a certain amount of uh, liberation. First, social psychology was strong and was strong in Michigan. And that was nice to be in a world where that, that was so well regarded. And the program was sort of like a New York City of social psychology. There were just ideas all over the place. And uh, I got put on a committee. I described this in the book. Uh, and I saw data that were a puzzle to me that African-American kids, even with very high test scores, were not doing as well as other kids with those test scores. And why, should, I, why shouldn't they? They're, they've got comparable preparation here. They should be doing as well in terms of grades and graduation rates. They weren't, still aren't. Why, would, why was that? So that was the problem. And, uh, and something about being in that different environment <clears throat> licensed me to take the problem as a problem to design research about. And, and I, I, so I, I, I feel a great deal of gratitude to uh, people that uh, kind of implicitly sort of allowed that to happen. Uh, and and the, the, the really great thinkers there, Bob Zients and, and Hazel Marcus and Dick Nisbet, uh, they changed problems. And, and they didn't stick with one problem. And I, that was a you can do that. <laughs> so um, I did it and, mm -hmm. and, and floundered in the woods for a long time before something coherent like stereotype threat eventually emerged, probably five years. Mm -hmm. of so what was your first study on that topic that really you think kind of crystallized some of your ideas? Well, there was with Steve Spencer, the, the two people who I were two students who I worked with during that era and who are really intricately involved in everything about that work were Steve Spencer and Josh Aronson. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, uh, the, the first study was with, with Steve and I did with women in math because we found the same thing happened for women in advanced math courses that was happening to minority, to African Americans across the board. And we found out that was a, a national trend. It wasn't just a Michigan problem. So we did an experiment to see if we could bottle this thing in the laboratory. And then, of course, if you get it in the laboratory, this is the beauty of social psychology, then you can take it apart. You can see how it's mediated and what the parameters are and what it generalizes to. And so, but you got to get first, you got to get a hold of it experimentally. And so we brought in uh, really good uh, men and women math students, and we gave them a, a half hour really difficult math test. And, our prediction was that for women, they wouldn't, even though they were as good as the men because we'd carefully match them, they wouldn't do as well because uh, when they got frustrated, and this test was set up to be frustrating, there'd be this extra worry that they were confirming what everybody seems to think about women's math ability. And sure enough, that happened, and uh, eventually, pretty quickly, we came up with a way of really proving, if I can use that word loosely, uh, <laughs> that this suppression with stereotype threat by taking stereotype threat out of that situation and seeing their test scores go up. And we took stereotype threat out of the situation simply by telling them that, you know, you may have heard that women aren't as good as, as men on, on difficult math tests. You might have heard that, but that's not true for this math test. The math test you're taking today, women always do as well as men. 
Now, of course, it was the same math test in which mm -hmm. they underperformed when you didn't say anything. But when you said that, their performance went up to match that of equally skilled men. And when that happened, I knew we had something. I knew this, that there was some piece of psychology that was a part of this and that it was a powerful piece because it could affect intellectual performance, uh, things that we think of are kind of above reproach like that, you know, that, you know yeah, but you give people a test and that's pretty much what they can do. So you've shown this, you know, a bunch of times, right? In different contexts, you know, I was a, I was a white sprinter, that was a problem. Um, yeah, we talked about that. Yeah, That's I mean, I could only, you know, get second or third, but uh -huh. um, anyways, the uh, so so uh, so we know this now, right? And pretty much, I mean, this this concept, I think, as I told you, I think you, we do. There's um, still some doubters, yeah, but well, I think we do. You know, I teach intro psych, and I, as I, I told you the other night, you know, all of my intro students know about this concept before I teach it to them, right? So I really think it has, you know, emerged in our sort of popular conception about, you know, how different social groups affect our behavior. But now that we know this, what can we do about it? Like, where do we go with that information to try to reduce the impact of, of stereotype threat on our behavior that, you know, is, is unfavorable? Because sometimes I think it helps. Yeah, I do yeah. too. Uh, well, I think we're learning a lot of things about what to do about it. And the, conveniently for this interview, the New York Times had that article this Sunday about uh, uh, interventions which derive from that kind of framework, yep. uh, uh, and Carol Dweck's work and Hazel's work, this sort of showing that the psychological side of learning is a big factor. So that was a student at the University of Texas in Austin, yeah, right, and that's about right. her path trying to find her place as a black student, black nursing student, I believe. That's right. Yeah, that's right. So that student was just like the students I saw those almost 30 years ago or uh -huh. 25 years ago at Michigan who were underperforming. Uh, and and uh, sadly, it's still like a lot of uh, first generation students, uh, underrepresented minority students, as they encounter these, these university environments. I th I'm, I'm gonna call that the fundamental educational challenge of America in some sense, is, is that uh, these universities, the, that we're immensely proud of, um, strong universities, are kind of designed for a relatively homogeneous, pretty well prepared student body. That's what they're kind of designed to deal with. But increasingly, they're confronted with uh, a student body that is really quite diverse, comes from very different backgrounds. There's, they have very different kinds of identity issues and questions about them. And, th and those students, as they come on campus, they, they face a, a sort of host of of, of unknowns about themselves mm -hmm. and how much they belong there and how comfortable they can be and whether they can make it there and the, just a host of unknowns that are very threatening and a certain part of their consciousness is allocated to sorting through that, figuring that mm -hmm. out and like I was doing when I was in graduate school. Can I is there, can I, do I belong here, do I fit, can I, that, that just because of their identities is extra tasks they have to deal with. And somehow or another, our institutions have to figure out how to deal with that. And I thought that article and that the emerging literature uh, on interventions that uh, Greg Walton and, and Jeff Cohen and Valerie Purdy, uh, uh, and um, uh, I'm just gonna block on a whole bunch of, don't, of, don't of names <laughs> of wonderful <laughs> dear students. Uh, but that literature, I, I, that's the thing I'm most proud of. Yeah. And I think it, it, is the, the, it constitutes the strongest evidence about the importance of these processes in the everyday experience of, of people. Right. So Greg was your, was your colleague at Stanford, and it was at Stanford right, where you first got into administration. Um, and so what, you know, what made you want to move into administration from, from your sort of standard research career? What inspired that? Was it this? This, you know, mo this inspiration you had from your work, or what really, what, what motivated you to go that direction? Um, and what did you, what did you gain, and what did you lose by doing that? Mm. Well, those are heavy questions. Sorry, so. I'm just getting a little <laughs> heavy here. You know, winding yeah, up, um, it's going to get heavy. Okay. <laughs> so. uh, um, well, I didn't want to do administration, and uh -huh. uh, I, I first was the chair of the psychology department at Stanford. That was my first real administrative job, uh -huh. and. Uh, I liked it. 
I kind of I kind of liked it. Um, you can make you things happen for other it, people. Because they kept asking you to do other things. Uh, I was okay at it. Yeah. I don't know if I was always good at it, but uh, <laughs> you can you can get better at it. And and for psychologists, I have to say, it's, there's a lot of fun. It's deeply deeply interesting. It's like being in the middle of of a Shakespearean play. The drama, the drama of the department, yes. The drama of the department, the drama of a university, yeah. it's, <laughs> ew, it's rich. <laughs> <laughs> all the students will get to know that. It's got all the party, dimensions yes. of <laughs> great, great drama, money, crisis, yeah. publicity, fear of publicity, and mishandled uh, and sometimes, dimensions. Sometimes yeah. the fights are so bad that the stakes are so low. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> And I, I, so I, I would say uh, I just grew to kind of be more and more actually interested in it, intellectually and, and in fundamental ways, interested in it and in, interested in how universities work and in how you can make them or how you, could, how you have to work to make them meet the needs of people mm -hmm. and to, to meet the challenge I just described, that fundamental educational challenge, uh, that's always a back mission of mine. How can we get these great institutions, which that have, I think the, some of the greatest institutional creations in the history of the world, these great institutions. Yeah. Berkeley, for example, is an, I don't want to brag about it, but well, it's an ahead. amazingly great institution. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and at the same time, it, it, it is in, in the United States an engine of upward mobility. Ber Berkeley has twice as many low-income students in it as, as most Ivy League universities have students. Wow. So the scalability of that and the need to uh, deliver high quality education to such to a, a broad and more diverse uh, po population is just critical to the United States uh, prosperity and survival and the quality of life for all of us. So I, I think it's a great mission to work on. And I do feel that way about it. And I think a lot of people who do that work now feel that way uh, mm -hmm. about it, that there's something at stake and that it's important uh, work so that uh, that that idea eventually kind of captured me. Mm -hmm. And so, as provost, you feel like you have the at least the the position to start to make some change, some bigger change. In about seven percent of what you do, you have a chance to yeah well, make make change. And that's, you know, the that's, rest of it, that's a lot in the, in the scheme things. of things, yeah. right? So, all right, I just have a I just have a few you know sort of more personal questions. Oh. Sorry. It's um, a real tough question. So do you have any secret talents? <laughs> uh, I, th I like to think I can make barbecued ribs as good as ah. anybody on earth, even and with, with pretty modest equipment. So what's that? Uh, modest if, equipment? If you tell me you can make barbecued ribs, I want to know what you're making them on, and then we'll see. You know, so, so they, they, like they do have equipment now that you can just almost anybody can make really good ribs. But uh, given the bad so, equipment so that I have, so we put you I'm in really a desert, good. yeah, you know, with some hot rocks, right? <laughs> I could I could make some good ribs. A little barbecue sauce, yeah. <laughs> it's taken yeah. a lifetime. But. Well, I, I think I have to come to your house some night. So yeah, yeah, have yeah. some ribs. Okay, <laughs> so uh, so speaking of of coming to your house for dinner, mm -hmm. if you could uh, have dinner with one person from any time in history. Who would that be? Or it could be a Oh, I know the I answer to that oh, question. Oh, you do? Yeah. Do you want to tell me? Miles Davis. <laughs> ah, yeah. I could totally see that. What would you ask him? Oh, man, I don't know where I'd begin. Um, I just feel, feel that I've learned a lot from him. You yeah. know, uh, my son is, is a musician, and he's his generation. He's interested in other people. But for my generation, Miles Davis was, was just, he just pulled together. That the artistry, mm -hmm. the 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 art that's like they're to me twentieth century Picasso, Miles Davis. You, you, that. So um, I'd I'd love to have have dinner with him and, and just talk to him about all kinds of things. He ran, he he had a very dark side. Don't get married to him. Uh, <laughs> Thanks for the advice. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but. Uh, he was he was brilliant with his bands, uh -huh. and I, I I really thought about that with 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 students. Uh, you you want to let he he benefited from letting his 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 players uh, bring everything they had to the band, mm -hmm. and and that made his music constantly fresh and changing. And I think that's a, that's a, a valuable point in science. So, so learn from our students. You, you want to make it social. Do. Yeah. Always do. Yeah, let them tell you stuff. Even yeah. when they even their first year students and and don't know much about the field. 
uh, their, their judgments yeah. about psychology can be quite good. Well, they're a little closer to, you know, not being clouded by all the things yeah. we've learned. So. Um, so this is my last question. So if you could talk to Claude Steele on his first day of being a professor at the University of Utah, <laughs> what would the Claude Steele, Claude Steele of today tell the Claude Steele then? Hmm. Well, I suppose some of the, I'll call them tricks, uh, I learned, I wish I knew then, I would have made that early part of the career go a little faster. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so tricks uh, like? Tricks like uh, when you're thinking theoretically, when you're thinking about psychological things, take the perspective of the actor, not the observer. The observer is you're looking at somebody, you're trying to understand them, it's really hard. And the experiments I was designing when I thought that way were thin and, and get little bitty effects and nothing else would. But when you, when you take the perspective of somebody who's in a psychological situation, who's actually in it, mm -hmm. a student, uh, somebody who's intoxicated, uh, as soon as you do that, every, every, everything, everything is a lot clearer and, and it, your intuition is much better informed. So the kind of experiments you design and, and work you do, uh, for me, just was like a switch that yeah. things started to work. Yeah. And, and I could be conversant in that space. Uh, so that was a big trick of thinking. Yeah. And maybe this holds for all science, I don't know, but for social psychology, uh, it, it, it was an ex extremely helpful perspective. I can go back in the field and, and look at work that I think came from that perspective uh -huh. versus an observer's pr perspective. And, and I, I would think, I think that cognitive dissonance theory is a perfect example of yep. taking the actor's perspective. So, so I got this thought, I got that thought. How am I going to reconcile them? What's the deal? Why, well, who is that? <laughs> <laughs> that's that's kind of where you want to be yeah. thinking about. So this, that's the end of our interview. I just want to say it was so much fun for me and such an honor. Well, so thank, well, you, thank so you. You're a great interviewer. This oh, well, I'm, I'm trying to bring out my inner Oprah. So, <laughs> anyways, You've got a future. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>